All right. Hopefully you guys can see my screen. So we'd like to welcome everyone to our CFA program webinar. What is the FinEd? Well, um, basically our aim was to make sure that we never make financial learning a boring experience. And how are we going to do that? Well, we're redesigning and structuring our classes so that we feature a whole lot of interactivity and a little bit of innovation using modern ed tech technologies. In addition to that, we hope to um, ensure that financial learning is accessible to everyone, both globally as well as in our domestic market, which is Pakistan. So let's start off with um, what we plan to achieve in this webinar. We're going to start off with an introduction to our speakers. We're going to give the center stage to them. We're going to next break down the CFA program, give you some minute details. Then we're going to go on to navigate the career prospects of a CFA charter holder. Again, we're going to give the mic to our speakers to do that for us. We're going to end our session with a Q&A. Who am I? Well, I'm Nidha Najib. I'm the co-founder. I'm a CFA charter holder as well as an ACCA affiliate. And I'm Sarish Babur. I'm also one of the co-founders at the FINED, and I'm a CFA charter holder and an MBA majoring in finance and, and investment. Okay, so um, I'm going to give the mic to our speakers turn by turn so that they can introduce themselves, starting off with Mohammed Asim, if you could please give an introduction to yourself. Okay, thank you, Nita. Thank you, Pinad, for uh, inviting me here. I'm pleased to be here. Uh, first of all, myself. Uh, so I'm a CFA charter holder and currently working as Chief Investment Officer with uh, Pakistan's uh, leading asset management company, MCBR for Beef Savings and Investments. Uh, my career has mainly been within the investment markets. So I have worked within the, as a finance professional, I started my career as uh, uh, in the investment industry, in the treasury markets, and then have uh, been managing the largest uh, uh, portfolio in terms of uh, the fixed income and equity markets. Uh, uh, while uh, along with my professional career, I have been closely engaged with CFA Society Pakistan. I have earlier served on the board of CFA Society and the, and uh, have just stepped down as the president of CFS Society Pakistan. So this is my brief introduction. Thank you, Austin, for the introduction. I'm going to next hand over the mic to Kamar Aftab. Kamar Aftab, if you can please give us an introduction. Thank you very much uh, for this opportunity. Um, my name is Kamar Aftab. I'm from Pakistan. Um, I'm a CFA charter holder. I Complete. I was 20 when I started CFA, so I was pretty young. I was done with CFA by 22 uh, and got my charter when I was 24. Um, and basically, while I was studying for CFA, um, I started my career, worked with a holding company based out of Lahore, moved with them to UAE, um, then spent three years with the Royal Family Investment Office in Qatar, where we were managing private equity, real estate, corporate finance sort of portfolio across Europe and, and Middle East. Um, and then in 2018, I moved back to Pakistan with uh, with Karandas Pakistan. It is a non-profit uh, organization, but it it functions as as a private equity boutique, or rather, it's as an impact fund um, focused on providing access to finance to small and medium enterprises and individuals. Um, I looked after the uh, private equity investments there. Um, and then in 2020, I moved back to the Middle East. At the moment, I am with Red Sea Farms, an agriculture technology company based out of uh, King Abdullah University, Saudi Arabia. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Kamar. All right, next, I'm going to hand over the mic to Justin Q. Justin Q, if you could give us an introduction. Hi everyone, thank you so much Nida for the invitation and also thank you Finette uh, for the invitation as well. And thank you everyone for, for, for tuning in on the Saturday. I know um, it's, it's sort of a um, great commitment to get everyone to get together to, to discuss about CFA and the whole career development side. Uh, so, so myself briefly, um, I sort of started a career 
a bit longer, I think probably more than a decade now, but I sort of got my CFA around so 2012 and sort of been doing sort of been investment side most of the time. But for the last seven years or so, I started going into this whole sustainable, sustainable investment space, i.e. ESG investment, which some of you may heard or may not heard about it yet. But it's becoming very a big top topic within Europe itself. So very happy to talk through some of that later today, uh, as I've still been doing this since um, when people did not talk about it to become a very hot topic now in Europe. Thank you, wonderful. Okay, so let's start off with a breakdown of the CFA program and an introduction. Sarish, over to you. Thank you, Neda. So let's start off by understanding exactly what is the CFA program and what makes it so special and so sought after in the investment industry. So first of all, as um, you all might know, and for our audience as well, you have to, in order to earn the CFA degree, you have to pass three very comprehensive exams, which are known as C levels, uh, level one, two, and three respectively. And they do cover a very, um, they do require very rigorous um, study and they involve a lot of current market practices. They are very updated because this curriculum that is designed by the CFA Institute, it is constantly updated and it includes the inputs of industry experts. So not only is this curriculum very relevant, but it also makes sure that you can um, opt for a lot of different diverse paths, a range of diverse paths within the investment industry. And after that, you would require at least three years of work experience. So once you do get your degree, um, the, your employers know that you have been to employ you. Um, so it equips you for the real world, as I mentioned, and it gives you, opens up a number of opportunities for you. So you just don't think of it as a program that would allow you to manage for portfolios only. You can opt for a number of degrees, for a number of different uh, jobs. For example, you can start your own firm. You can be entrepreneurs. Uh, you can go to the research side. You can go for asset and wealth management. Um, you can even join traditional commercial banks. So the CFA program basically opens up all these opportunities for you, even though portfolio management is the biggest feature of this program, but it does equip you with other skills that are also required. And that is why it is sometimes considered as the gold standard in the investment industry. Next, please. Right. So um, in order to be eligible to actually enter into the CFA program or register for it, the Institute recognizes that candidates are coming from diverse backgrounds. So the minimum entry requirements have been designed to accommodate this. If you have a bachelor's or an equivalent degree, you can, you're eligible to register for the CFA level one. However, if you are in your final year of your bachelor's, the time duration between your exam date, your CFA exam date, and your graduation date should not be more than 11 months. Now, let's just suppose you do not have these two, uh, you do not fit with these, these two entry requirements, but you have 4,000 hours of qualified professional work experience. You are also eligible to apply for the CFA. Um, the fourth um, requirement, which if you do not fulfill these first three requirements is that you can have a combined education and work experience of a minimum of 36 months. CFA program costs. How much do you pay to enter into the CFA? Well, anyone who's entering into the CFA for the very first time pays a one-time non-refundable non -refundable, sorry, enrollment fee of $450. And the rule of the game is the earlier you pay, the more you save. So if you pay before a certain date, you save up on $300. If you pay by, if you miss that deadline, you have to pay $1,000. Registering for the CFA exam means that you get entitled to a free e-copy of the CFA book for each level. However, if you want a printed, printed hard copy, you need to pay $208 per level. What does the typical CFA calendar look like for any candidate applying for a particular exam? Well, just to give you a heads up, the CFA, each exam of the CFA occurs over multiple times uh, per year. And you, it, your candidates are quite lucky because back then when we started off, 
level one was twice a year and two and three was once a year respectively. So let's just walk you through the calendar for any candidate, let's assume is applying for registering for the August 2022 exam. The registration window will open in October and you can see a word uh, words such as scheduling window opens. What does the registration means? Well, this is the first time you get to register for the level one exam. Scheduling window. Well, CFA exams occur over a particular week. So um, over a seven day period, you can book an exam on the date of your convenience as well as seat availability at the exam center. So um, on by February, your, your um, chance to pay $700 and save up on $300 ends. However, you can still register for the CFA level one exam until May 2022. But you do notice that the scheduling deadline, that means your ability to schedule for your exam is still open even after registration closes. Let's just suppose now you wanted to change your exam date. You had already picked it on, let's say, October 26th. You are allowed to change your exam date up till 25th, free of cost, May 25th, that is. However, if you you pass this deadline and you still want to reschedule, the CFA exam, uh, Institute allows you to do so, but you have to pay $250. And the ability to reschedule after the scheduling deadline ends on 23rd of, um, on 23rd subsequently. And the, the schedule ends with an exam week. Okay, so um, as I mentioned, it is a very, the CFA curriculum is extremely comprehensive and it is basically divided into 10 areas, which we have visually depicted for you. Uh, this information has been taken from the CFA website. However, they do give ranges, uh, percentage weightage of each area. And we have just taken a simple average in order to visually depict how the different areas would be tested. So as you can see from level one, to two, and then as we move on to level three, the green portion, which is portfolio management, is greatly increased in weightage. Uh, with level three, almost half of the exam is tested on concepts concerning portfolio management. And um, this, all these 10 areas, they encompass, encompass a lot of diverse skills that would be necessary in the practical world. And it is constant, as I mentioned, is updated. So for example, at the time I took the exam, FinTech was not part of the curriculum, but now it is and so on. And so they keep uh, updating this. And again, FRA, which is financial reporting and analysis, the orange portion, uh, that is also makes up a considerable portion because that basically forms the basis on which you could analyze um, investment companies and firms and institutions. So this is basically how it is. Uh, the exam is structured. So let's go to the exam format. Uh, it is an e-format, a computer-based exam now. And um, in level one and level two, they're purely MCQ-based questions, which is multiple choice. Um, the difference being that uh, level one has shorter and easier questions. So there'll be two, three liners and you have to just pick the right answer. However, in level two, you have to read a particular case study, which is also known as the item set. And after reading that, you have to answer around four to six questions, which are related to that particular item set. So an average amount of time you get for um, a particular question varies from 1.5 to three minutes, depending on the difficulty of the question, you have to time your exam accordingly. And in level three, we have a different set of questions, which are the essay questions, also known as the constructed response questions. Uh, you have to basically write, you'll be given an empty space and you have to write. And mostly uh, portfolio management questions um, are essay questions and they're basically judging your capability in understanding uh, different real life scenarios. So this is how the level three is different from the other two. Um, let's, next, please. Okay, so, so how does your exam cycles look like? As I mentioned, CFA level one, two, and three occur over multiple times a year, with level one occurring the most frequently followed by level two and three. All this information is available on the CFA Institute website, but we've just pulled it out and visually depicted it to make it easier to understand. Okay, this is a very important um, part of the webinar because a lot of students are, um, 
very much eager to know whether the CFA offers any scholarship opportunities? The answer is yes. The CFA Institute offers five types of scholarships. Now, the best thing about this scholarship is that the in initial enrollment fee of $450 is waived off. The second good thing about the scholarship program is that you can apply for a scholarship for level one, two, and three. So it's not just a one time. Um, uh, you don't even need, are allowed to avail it one time. So let's just discuss, first of all, the access scholarship. It's for all those students who cannot afford CFA program tuition fees. And if you meet all the uh, minimum entry requirements, you can apply for the scholarship. The women's scholarship is designed exclusively for women who do not who are not eligible for any of the other CFA Institute scholarships. However, they, the condition is that they, they should have not registered for the CFA exam. If you are a student and studying at an affiliated university, you're eligible to apply for the student scholarship program. Again, you need to meet the minimum entry requirements, plus you, you should have not registered for the CFA exam prior to the application for the scholarship. Um, what do we mean by affiliated university? Well, the CFA Institute um, mentions, specifies a whole list of universities, and you can easily see if your university is on that list. The professor scholarship is open to all full-time university and college professors, as well as department heads and administrators who are teaching credit hours. Um, again, any professor applying for this scholarship should not have registered for the CFA exam prior to applying for the scholarship. The regulatory scholarship, regulator, sorry, scholarship is open for all employees of central banks, security regulators, government entities who have actually signed an agreement with the CFA, as well as any other body actively involved in designing and advocating regulation. So um, we've actually written down how much the, um, the, uh, the registration fee has reduced to. So as if you can see, for instance, the access scholarship, your um, exam fee will be reduced to $250. So that's quite a big saving. Okay, so how long will it take to complete the exams? And um, this is also a visual depiction taken directly from the CFA Institute. It looks a little complicated, but what you need to understand is now you can sit for the exam uh, for more than it's the exam windows are open four times a, a year. So now the duration is considerably shortened. So if you do pass your uh, all three exams in first attempt, uh, you can complete your um, uh, these set of exams in around 1.5 years. Okay, so the next question is, um, once you have passed all three levels of the exam, how do you get the charter? Well, obviously the first step is going to be passing all three levels. Next, you have to complete 4,000 hours of relevant professional experience in a time window, a minimum time window of 36 months. Now, what do we mean by qualified professional work experience? The CFA Institute on its website um, defines this as actively involved in the investment decision-making process or otherwise producing work that is going to be adding value to the process. Also, you need to obtain professional references from your employer who will um, uh, write down or comment on your professional character as well as your qualification and experience, work experience. You need to submit also a work description, pay your annual dues, and file a professional conduct statement and a membership agreement. Now, what is the professional conduct statement? It's basically you're signing off and identifying whether you've been subject to any ethical or legal violations or are subject to any disciplinary uh, proceedings or, or, any, or if you're subject to any written complaint from a fellow member. Now we're coming to that part of the webinar where we're going to give each of our speakers again the mic so that they can actually navigate the career in their respective industries. We're going to request our speakers to uh, give candidates, both aspiring as well as current, as well as CFA charter holders, what the prospects of the um, careers are in their industry and how, what, how and what candidates should do to stay relevant in the industry, what skills they should acquire to up their game, as well as to give us a ballpark figure of salary ranges and 
um, bonuses that they should expect to um, attain on their journey from candidate to charter holder. So I'm going to start off with Mohamed Asim. Mohamed Asim, if you could please. Okay, thank you, Nida. I hope I am loud and clear. So, so, so about the banking and asset management, I'll just uh, begin with the asset management, which is uh, my main career role as well. So within the asset management, uh, I would say that uh, the core finance roles uh, that uh, would be suitable for CFA charter holders or those pursuing interest in the CFA program would include, first of all, there is one side, which is the core asset management, that is the investment management. Then there are subsets within the asset management that would include uh, investment research, then there is uh, investment trading, which are called dealers, and then there is the fund management side. And uh, the third, which is again related to fund management, is more sort of advisory roles or investment advisory, which we can say a form of uh, wealth management. Uh, so, so this is one side within the asset management, uh, where, which are relevant for CFA charter holders. Then the two other sides include, again, the marketing of financial products, uh, the mutual funds, uh, the advisory services, which is where, again, the CFA charter holder and you know, the background that CFA curriculum empowers you can become very helpful in advising clients, approaching them, explaining them about the investment opportunities. The third area which I feel relevant is the risk management side, which again, uh, you get very strong uh, uh, the, uh, the support from the CFA curriculum, plus along with your uh, graduate degree, you can become a good candidate in these three roles. Uh, I think accounting may not be, because again, if you have uh, already pursued your accounting career, then uh, that could be left for more core accounting professions. Uh, uh, other than that, I think uh, is uh, the within the asset management are back office operations. So, but three major areas that I have identified for them. Uh, I think now let's uh, differentiate between the again the, the entry levels. What could be the entry points? So, for the fresh charter holders, or the fresh candidates, uh, I would say that uh, particularly. Let's talk about first asset management, uh, the investment management, or in research. Uh, subset of core, which is considered, uh, I would say, the most sought after uh, career uh, by a finance professional or those who are really interested in asset management is investment research. So mostly uh, the, the investment analysts are hired as fresh candidates. And uh, when, you are when you are coming uh, or you are applying to an asset management company or within, so, 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 so let's also include within asset management the uh, the brokerage firms as well, uh, which we call sell side, which are the brokerage firms and right equity research and are, and are involved in advising clients about the equity securities listed at stock exchange. So the buy side and sell side research uh, includes candidates usually who have background in the graduate degree in finance and also have some uh, have done some levels of CFA program. So when a candidate applies, of course, when uh, you have pursued some levels of CFA program, your chances of getting hired or uh, being considered by the prospective employer have definitely increased because the uh, CFA program uh, has a lot of, uh, has a very strong resource and background uh, focused on the asset management roles. So this empowers you with the theory about economics, uh, portfolio management, uh, uh, equity valuation, fixed income valuation, risk management, which is very important. And one more area which I think is very important that is also increasingly seen by the employers is the ethics side, which again is also uh, within the CFA curriculum, very much focused on the investment professional investment research. So within the asset management, within the investment side, this becomes a very strong uh, point for any candidate when you're competing with a candidate who is just a graduate. Uh, having said that, I think uh, uh, within, the, within any function, whether it's uh, research, whether it's uh, risk management, or whether it's uh, wealth management, or marketing of financial services, even include banking, uh, your uh, 
the ability to do so 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 this is one thing that you get an interview or you get uh, screened out this is uh, another thing that you actually get hired so where this is where you actually have to demonstrate how you have uh, uh, acquired the skills the curriculum how you have absorbed it and how it reflects in your overall understanding because uh, some people do get to clear a particular level of exam but are not actually relate themselves or actually not live into uh, uh, the particular career so so they are just pursuing a direction so i think that also becomes very important i think when whoever is pursuing a cfa program should uh, be very uh, in any career or, pro or pursuing any academic uh, program one should be very uh, i would say clear about his interest assess them it makes a suitable set because if you are comfortable with a particular career you tend to do well you tend to enjoy it and you tend to excel in your long term career as well so this is uh, about uh, the uh, the investment management industry now i mentioned about the the entry levels about the mid levels uh, i think entry of uh, the cfa program helps again Im uh, improve your chances of getting hired but it as you move in your career as you get more experience what is more important for a particular role is what background you have what experience you have of course uh, when you are uh, applying for a experience analyst job or for an experience risk management professional or for a mid career advisory professional it becomes important that you have particular experience as well so again here uh, i have seen people who pursue cfa program which is totally outside their experience in the middle of their career uh, so and they expect that they will get a particular job because they have pursued CFA. so so the so cfa again here does help you in getting uh, screened out you are faring better in your academic part but at mid level your background experience can also becomes very important and that can help you in pursuing a career or get getting selected for a particular job uh but then asset management uh, as i mentioned earlier risk management and uh, the marketing of financial services i would say wealth management a uh, safer program again is also very important because especially when uh, uh, and and again is also very sort of qualification uh, so in all three roles uh, cfa program because this is again the very strong part of the cfa curriculum that is the asset management side we learn as i mentioned earlier the various parts which are all applicable and very much relevant that is why employers see it as uh, a very valuable additional credential to your uh, overall profile now within the banking sector uh, i would say again there are uh, selected roles uh, where cfa program is also very useful and does help you in getting a particular job and improve your chances of getting hired for instance uh, uh, treasury risk management uh, corporate banking the address risk management corporate banking again uh, the marketing side as well so this is where again since uh, banking is also about uh, again your understanding about the financial products markets helps you a lot and this is where your uh, cfa program can improve your chances uh, again uh, within the banking industry i would say uh at the entry level again this helps you a lot uh, uh because again relevant to a particular candidate uh, uh who has again graduate degree but if you have a cfa you have pursued cfa level 1 or 2 uh i would say that would help improve your chances of uh gain considered or would be seen favorably now about the salary levels i would say that generally when you have uh uh like the first of all at the entry level Uh, a, per, a particular progress on the CFA program helps you getting hired, improve your chances of getting hired, and you have done well. Your overall resume is, is the strength is improved. Your background, uh, graduate degree, and your uh, the CFA program level helps you in uh, getting better compensation as well. Uh, particularly within the asset management, uh, the employers uh, pay a premium. usually this premium is about 20 25% or may go up to 50 55% of the average graduate level uh that they would be willing to pay while within the banking i would say that there is some premium but usually since uh, at the entry level the banking compensation package is are standardized but again it helps you in getting 
uh, considered by the employer. While in the end, in the mid career, again, uh, as I said, it's a combination of CFA program is an additional qualification. If it's relevant to your profession, your background experience, this is definitely going to give you an edge. And again, here, the premium varies 20%, 30%. But there is additional premium of your qualification because employees do value uh, the CFA program for a particular role. So this is about uh, banking and asset management. I hope that I have uh, answered uh, the areas you wanted me to talk about. Yes, thank you. That was a very comprehensive guide. Hopefully our candidates and our viewers are going to learn a lot from this. Okay, so we are going to now move on to Justin. Justin, I hand over the mic to you. I oh, sorry, trying to get um, so get myself set up. So maybe I'll start from the sustainable ESG side then, um, because it's it's sort of a new new topic for many people. So what does ESG mean? I think that's that's probably the first good thing to start. So ESG really is is not just about looking at company whether a company is doing great products or not. It really is about how you should think about you know, part of your investment analysis, how to incorporate the additional uh, non financial factors. Which could be financial factors to to um, that, that could affect the valuation. So just to sort of paint that picture there. So in terms of career wise in, in ESG, what is important? How does CFA actually help? Well, the, the very basic thing about on the CFA program is about how do you value a company from an equity or fixed income perspective. Now to incorporate ESG into this is really understanding on how how some of these non-financial factors, for example, the emissions of a company, the waste usage of a company, how the company treats the employees, you know, to understand how this affects the valuation of a company. So the CFA is actually quite well to prepare yourself to, for, first of all, get the very basic right on financial valuation, accounting, and then start to figure out how does, you know, how does employee turnover actually affects the growth of the company, which will affect your, your overall valuation. How, um, how, how is the business products, for example, that could feed in the overall themes in the world. For example, if you're an oil and gas company, you're going to start to think about is a growth trajectory, the right growth trajectory, and that affects the discount rate that you apply to, to the company you're trying to value. So I think the, the, the program actually prepares itself quite nicely to, to fit the, the whole rising increased focus on ESG. The second thing is that the CFA program also over the last couple of years has started to bulk up the ESG sections in the program. When I did this program 10 years ago, I think, I think ESG was like one or two pages and mostly focused on governance. But the recent updated program has actually got a bigger, bigger chunk of chapter actually included in, into this. And actually the CFA also has a separate ESG certificate that has actually recently been launched um, last year with, with the pilot program in the UK. And then now it's actually launched globally. And I think the UK has also recently launched a climate change program within the CFA UK as another pilot program with the plan to actually launch this globally. So you can see the importance of focus in this topic has actually made this, this whole financial analysis quite interesting because you're trying to bring in the softer, subjective, uh, longer data factors that is traditionally not there to be factored in into the financial valuation. So I think this is a very interesting sort of subject and topic to, to continue to explore. And you know, at your stage of your career, for some of you today, I would strongly suggest look into this because where the capital is flowing into today, this is going to become, it start to become important, it will increasingly become more and more important. And just to give you an idea of the market size, in Europe itself, 35% of the, of the assets now invested are coming from ESG funds. And this is only going to continue to grow because more and more regulation is coming into place within Europe, forcing more capital to, to flow to green. China is doing the same thing. India is trying to think about the same thing. The US is trying to think about the same thing. And thinking from the consumer side, who doesn't want a fund that, 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 that's going to invest to generate a return plus doing good to the planet society? I mean, it, it's a bit of a no-brainer to, to think about from that perspective. So, so that, that, that's sort of my sort of two cents on what will be interesting, why is this an interesting topic to look at. Now, in terms of you know, career development-wise, you know, what would you, what would my, my suggestions will be, I think it'll be sort of three simple things here. One of all is to, well, first of all, knowing what you really wanted to do, because, you know, having a goal, you know, think about the very traditional boring question people always ask is, oh, what do you see yourself in five years time? 
it's actually a very, very good question now not to think back you know, after a couple of years in the career, because if you have an idea of where you want to be in five years, and then you can start working backwards on how you want to get there. So that's the very first thing I would suggest to really think about in a sort of five year landscape. It's difficult, but you know, it's worth thinking about it. The second thing is trying to think about um, how, what, what are the, you know, being patient, because it, it, you will have a lot of upset. You will have you will face a lot of challenges along the way to to get to where your goal is in five years. Plus, you whatever effort you put in may not materialize in six months or a year or two years. So I think being patient is actually quite, quite key. I think lastly, which I always tell a lot of analysts coming into to work in the firm, is that the continuous learning is very important. Now, CFA is a starting place because it gives people the it equips you with, with the very basic to and I want to emphasize here the very basic to for you to be able to excel in 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 the financial in the investment management industry. However, if you stop there and think that that you already know everything, that's when your career starts to fall. So a very important thing to keep remembering is that you know whether you're an analyst, whether you are associate, or whether you are managing director, the day you stop learning is that the, the day when your career actually ends. And and I think that those will be my few few sort of top tips on that. Okay, thank you, Justin, for a very comprehensive um, guide. Next, we're going to move on to Kamar. All right, sure. Right, so basically, I mean, I'll, I'll quickly talk about, say that just 10% which Sato showed uh, on the screen, 10% of the, of the weightage of, of the CFA curriculum, which is alternative investments. Even though it sounds like pretty small, but that that in itself, private equity, corporate finance, real estate, venture capital, I mean, that's, that's a huge industry. Um, so I've spent, well, I mean, if I want to divide my sort of career and talk about that and then advise potential candidates or, or charter holders, um, one bit, I spent almost eight to nine years on the buy side with private equity boutiques and then moved to the sell side, which is where I am now working for a startup, raising funds for the company instead of investing. Um, so when we focus on, say, private equity, that side of the bet, um, the day-to-day -day really looks like, and I think it is important to mention here, when I was starting, I was done with ACCA, wanted to do something related to investment management, started CFA, but had no clarity whether I should go into research or say asset management or just corporate banking or do private equity. My interest was always um, in entrepreneurship, do something of my own. When I looked at some of the other options, I realized maybe I might say our value addition would be limited so in a private equity, you take a private business, could be just imagine any running business in say Pakistan or globally, could be a diagnostic business, could be, I don't know, an FFCG company. If they're not listed, they're really a private equity. They come to you, they want to raise funding either to grow their business or buy out, or it could be a mix of both. You really take the business. You don't really have a valuation at that point in time. You don't have a say a trading price at which you can buy their shares. So you have to do the valuation yourself. You have to build the financial model ground up, do the site visits, understand the business as if you are running the business yourself, do all of that, prepare your investment thesis, present it to your investment committee internally, get their approvals, get into transaction documentation, which is shareholder agreement, share subscription agreement, non-compete agreement and others. Um, and then basically, give them the funding and help them grow. Be an observer on their board or a board member, depending on, on how you negotiate the deal, but really help them grow, handhold them, because you really want those smaller businesses to grow and take them to a level where they can go public. And this is where you exit and you make your money. So that's really the end-to-end -end cycle. Um, and in terms of the other bit of my experience was in corporate finance, where you are working for a company which wants to raise funding this is where CFA helps quite a lot because it adds credibility to your profile when you're talking to uh, potential investors and you prepare, say, a financial model and tell them about the about your next five years projections. And if, like, when you date stamp it and you say, yeah, this has been prepared by a CFA, it adds a lot of credibility to your sort of analysis and it puts potential investors at ease that, yeah, this guy has, has done proper due diligence on, on the numbers that they've put in. Um, so see if it does add quite a lot to both sides, with which, whichever side you are on, either you are raising funding or whether you are investing funds. Um, so that's that. 
In terms of uh, how do you enter this industry, private equity, these days venture capital is quite, it's, it's a very hot industry in Pakistan and globally. Um, when I started, and I'll give real examples. When I started, I was struggling for an unpaid internship really, uh, even an unpaid, because that's really the point. And I would encourage everyone to even volunteer for paid, unpaid internships that can potentially lead to a full-time job. Um, generally, like expectations are, yeah, I've done say ACCA or CFA, and now my salary should be X hundred thousand. But that that doesn't really happen because employers they want you to add value from the get go. The day they start paying you, they want you to add value to the company as well. So you want to spend some time, develop say your financial modeling skills or research writing skills, presentation skills, and once you join the company, you can say, yeah, I'm adding value, and hence I'm getting paid. Uh, it's really an investment. Um, and then gradually, as you go along, as Asim rightly mentioned, your experience matters quite a lot. CFA does help. I, I have, this is sort of my fourth job and I could mention all four interviews saying, yeah, you're a CFA. This adds quite a lot to your sort of credentials and we're happy with this and we want to go ahead that sort of discussions. Um, in terms of financial benefits, I've been, again, actual numbers, I've been given, say, a 20% increment just because I'm a CFA. So that, that is one. Um, and on top of that, obviously, your experience and other things, they, they add quite a lot to it. From an investment, again, we are talking about investments and finance, all the fees, all the hard work you put in, in my opinion, I think CFA pays you back in less than six months, all your fees, all your time, everything at all. So the payback is pretty nice if you really want to look at it as an investment itself. Um, yeah, that, that's, uh, that's more about it, actually. Thank you, Kamar, for a very comprehensive um, guide. OK, so now we're coming to that part of our webinar where we're going to ask our, we have a one participant for any questions. We also have some questions which are, um, which can some candidates email to us. So we'll just, um, I guess, um, start with those. Sarish, if you could take the lead. Okay, so um, we did receive an email from an interested candidate, and I will just read out the question. Um, how has the degree of regulation posed a threat to the uniform development of the crypto market in countries where there is a ban, such as India and Pakistan? How far behind are these countries compared to the global market? So this is a very pertinent question. Uh, as we know, cryptocurrencies are the new thing. Um, if I could request uh, Mr. Asim, if he could please answer this question for us. Yeah, sure, Sarish. Uh, so I think it's with regards to uh, how crypto can evolve uh, and what's the future of crypto probably in countries uh, like us, developed countries, I think. Recently, first of all, on the regulatory level, you might have noted recently, State Bank Governor has given some guidance and some clue with regards to how the regulators look, are looking at it. And of course, that's not right now a very favorable review or uh, uh, indication about uh, the crypto adoption or being with they becoming part of the formal financial system. And uh, I think that's how it is because again, uh, for countries like you guys, as uh, the regulator mentioned, uh, there are mainly concerns about uh, with regards to KYC and uh, how uh, this cryptocurrency is being used within the uh, overall sphere, especially with regards to developing markets where a lot of wealth is within the undocumented sector. So it's untaxed, it's undocumented and uh, the, usually the effort or the focus of regulator is to bring the documentation part, uh, uh, again, to bring the economy and the overall uh, uh, cash that is outside the system to become part of the mainstream financial system. So I guess uh, with regards to regulatory, that's how it is, but that uh, I think continue to remain uh, under consideration and evolve over a period of time as more developed markets uh, uh, depends on how their regulators look at it. Some have uh, a favorable view. Some are still reviewing it and have not given a final opinion. But I guess uh, uh, it's 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 okay if the develop uh, developing market regulators are looking at uh, how 
the adoption is going on in the overall developed market. Uh, well, uh, personally speaking, I think uh, cryptos uh, are not necessarily just a currency. Again, they are just uh, probably part of, uh, as I see it, as again, part of uh, how the financial markets or financial innovation is, is coming up. Not necessarily you have to see it as an investment or have to see it as, uh, again, an alternative to investment market. This is, again, the chain of evolution uh, that is happening, innovation is happening. Uh, it's, it depends on how you approach it. Some people have started at speculating it on it and considering that this can be an alternative to uh, your conventional investments. Not sure how would it turn around because uh, its uh, valuation does not fit with regards to the cash flow model, the valuation models, rather it depends on how its adoption actually turns out. So, so the future, again, when there's uh, dependent on certain so many variables, you have to have a view whether it's going to be successful or not. However, your investments, particularly uh, when your investments uh, are form a very large portion of your future income stream, you want to be more measured. You want to be focused again uh, into assets where you can really uh, have a tangible view on the future performance. So I guess uh, 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 I think the future of crypto, they will remain part of the system. Their adoption uh, will depend uh, how the overall evolution takes across different parts of the world. Thank you so much for answering the question. Nita, do you have any? Yeah, I have a question from, and I have this question is for Justin, particularly with respect to ESG, and I'm going to read it out. How crucial is the need for an ESG representative on company boards and how should future charter holders prepare themselves for an asset management and financial industry, which will see more regulation in the ESG space? Sure. And I believe, so, yeah. So, uh, yeah, so I shall try to answer this question. So in terms of the board itself, yes, I think it is a trend that is, it's a skill shortage um, to be perfectly honest, because speaking to a lot of boards, they do acknowledge that they, they are trying to figure out what to do in this space and some are doing it better than the others. You see some of them hiring the right people, some are not really, and it's trying to learn along this space. It is a very evolving space right now in terms of this. I mean, even from the asset manager side or the pension funds or even the boards, because the regulation is constantly evolving very quickly. So it is, there's a skill, skill shortage in that space. So well, when there's a shortage, there's, there are opportunities, if, if you ask me. Now within the industry itself, yeah, I think I think being being a CFA charter holder is actually, like I said early on, it gives you the right skills and, and, and background that you are able to have very constructive conversation and pragmatic conversations with the regulators and also the end clients to help to evolve this industry. Now, without that question, you're just gonna have a lot of very sort of NGO mindset. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that one, but you know, forgetting what investment is supposed to do doesn't really help the industry. And the examples I can sort of share is that over the last few years, there has always been talks about, you know, ESG should be uh, ex all by exclusion. You know, oil and gas is bad, um, airline is bad, this is, this is bad, but that is bad. And then, but you think about it, you need the whole world to, 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 to transition in terms of if you want to meet, to, 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 to have a low carbon future, all the industries need to move together. Cements are polluting, but they need to also change their, their energy mix. Metals and minings are polluting, but you need metals and minings for, for the electric vehicles and also build out your wind turbines. So it's not just about don't touch some of those industries and call yourself green. Now that was the case a few years ago when ESG was a lot of heavily focused by people coming from a very NGO background, which, which did call to action, which is very good. But now people are getting more serious now to ask a question about how should we think about this from an investment perspective? How should we allocate capital towards um, the green solutions? And uh, why is it so important? Well, like I said earlier on, right, you can't just buy a company because it's green. As we have seen uh, last year itself, in 2020, all the, all the so-called ESG names have a huge capital flow into it, in regardless of its valuation. And 2021 is then, that's when realization starts to, to kick in. When the analyst starts to ask questions and kick the tires and say, hang on, all these utility companies, all these green companies, the valuation doesn't look very attractive. They're very expensive. And towards Q4 last year, you start to see the, the valuations start to be challenged when supply chain squeeze, prices go up, inflation starts to kick in, all these green companies, some of them are not making any profit at all. In actual fact, they're making a big loss. And so market, capital markets starts to react. 
So if you think about it, if you don't have CFA background, you just want to think about green and ESG, you're just going to end up buying all these companies and then end up losing your capital. But with a CFA background, if you understand valuations, how it works, then you start kicking the tires and figure out how to position your, your capital allocation to the, the good quality companies that is actually providing solutions for the future. So hopefully that, that answers the question. Yeah, that does. Thank you. All right, Sarish, over to you. Next question, if we have any. Yes, we do have another question. And I would like Mr. Kamar Aftab to please answer this for us. Let me read it out. How has the pandemic impacted the growth of the private equity and venture capitalist list markets given the flourish of new startups? How does the pace of this growth compare between the US and Europe on the one hand and the uh, MENA region on the other? So since you were talking about private equity, I think this would be a good question for you to answer. Please go ahead. Sure. Well, thank you very much. So I think pandemic has been, well, I mean, from an innovation and technology improvement perspective has been a blessing in disguise. Um, what happened, at least say in the Middle East, I mean, quite a lot of, even the governments, they went digital. Be it you, you have to access, say, a restaurant or you have to do anything at all. You have to travel. You have those digital applications you get all your approvals online. You can, you can pay people online, you can do transfers. Financial inc inclusion has improved quite a lot because now people were forced actually to go digital and move towards technology. I mean, and this has helped a lot in terms of bringing new companies to the region and even globally as well. Um, and we have seen like this year, I think in the Middle East, there were over $500 million worth of investments in, in the VC space. Um, that's half a billion dollars, that's, that's quite a lot. And as Justin mentioned, I mean, some of the valuations, they don't really make sense. We are talking about 2025 EBITDA multiples, um, but we will get to see and, 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 and evolve um, as we have more clarity. The market has been growing rapidly in US and, and, and MENA as well. I mean, obviously US and Europe, they are much more established markets as compared to MENA, but international investors are coming here. Uh, one important challenge, which I think is linked to what Justin was saying, is the ESG bit or even environmental sustainability in, in MENA. Most of the countries, they import their, their food from, from overseas. Um, so because of the pandemic, there were so many supply chain uh, disruptions countries started to grow their produce or vegetables and fruits or even generally food uh, themselves. And this is where technology again played a very big role. Most of the new say farming, indoor farming or vertical farming, control environment, agriculture, they came up um, and they attracted a lot of capital from the government and from the private sector itself. Um, yeah, I, I hope, I mean, I've, I've answered your question from that perspective. Yes, certainly. Thank you so much. Okay, we have one final question. And this question I would like to ask Asim. And the, this question, I'm going to read it out. What resistance have regulated financial institutions exhibited with respect to digital currencies? And will AI disrupt the asset management industry? What can prospective charter holders and candidates do to prepare for this? Okay. So, so with regards to, I think, digital currencies, of course, uh, this is uh, one hot topic that is being discussed uh, within the financial markets and with the regulators. Of course, uh, regulators are all looking at it, but even State Bank of Pakistan is also, I think, following and working on the digital currencies because this concept, again, uh, has a lot of potential. Several countries uh, I think are uh, already working on it and uh, some experimentation is going on. I recall China is one market uh, that on a limited scale, they are experimenting in it. Looks like it has uh, a good potential and uh, uh, but there is again a long way, particularly with regards to our markets. I think it's going to take a lot of time. Uh, uh, with regards to AI, or its impact on the investment industry or asset management industry. I think it does help the AI, of course, uh, uh, where we have seen in one form algorithms uh, being used across the globe uh, in uh, managing investments in portfolios. Some are uh, 
there to exploit arbitrage opportunity. Um, and ELGOs form a very strong part of uh, the investment management industry around the globe. Uh, Pakistan, yes, uh, it's, it, it, it's, not, it's on a very limited scale and uh, probably not a, on a very significant or material uh, assets are uh, invested on that. Uh, with regards to AI, of course, I think that can evolve uh, over a period of time. It has implications uh, on one side, uh, the investment management side, and on marketing as well. Uh, so, so I think uh, AI-based AI role of AI in uh, is already seen on social media. So we are already seeing the uh, the particular ads being targeted to a particular audience. Intelligent ways to market the or show the financial products. And I think that's where its evolution is taking, it's gaining on fast pace. However, with regards to investment management, probably it's a, it depends as markets evolve, especially in the context of Pakistan, since our markets are still at very early stage of the products, number of products are limited, the options, the markets are very or not very liquid. So I think it's, it's going to take a long time, but uh, of course, uh, it's 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 one area of development that is happening in developed markets, and I'm sure uh, would follow over a due course of time in our markets as well. Okay, thank you, Asim, for the detailed response. Okay, we have a very interesting question, and I will place this question to Kamar. Um, how do you see yourself structuring corporate finance deals in the metaverse in the future? Well, that's a very interesting question. Oh, how do I do that? And frankly, no idea. I mean, I'll be very honest instead of making up a response. Metaverse, that's something that's maybe for the, well, I mean, I won't consider myself old, but that's for the newer generation to explore and see how that is. Uh, but frankly, I mean, generally speaking, corporate transaction deals are pretty exciting to look at. And again, when it comes to corporate finance, sorry, the response might not be completely relevant, uh, but really the idea is thinking from a CFA charter holder's perspective, um, there could be a couple of preferences. One could be, I find I want to be a numbers person throughout my life and say, do the analysis and help companies grow from that perspective. The other could be when you are in corporate finance, you're actually helping the company grow and you could potentially be the CEO of your own business or some other business in the future. Um, so as, as a field, be it with metaverse or outside in real life, uh, it is pretty exciting to think of the business as is, help the company grow from, not just from finance perspective, but broadly what we call now the corporate development side, where, the, you, are, where you have once you want to raise funding for the company, once you're, once you're done, the corporate finance bit is a bit dim there, and then you really start expanding company we're opening up new markets for the company, helping them grow, be it with capacity development or corporate structure, or even more importantly, corporate governance as well. Um, so you could help with all of that. All right, thanks. Okay, I have a final question, and that is for Justin. Um, this is a res with respect to the comparison of Gen Z and millennials. How has the, uh, if you can compare their trends of investing, how would you compare which, which um, uh, category has a greater preference for investing in green companies and green solutions, firstly. And secondly, what's your take on exclusionary screens for those companies which are not adopting to climate friendly or do not have a climate friendly initiative, which includes reducing their carbon emissions? Well, the first question, hopefully, well, it's, it, it could be a it's very simple answer, actually. I think between Gen Z and millennials, I think obviously the investment horizon is different, but the preference to, to in, for their capital flows or an allocation to, to something greener and, and also for the future, it's quite obvious that, that Gen Z and millennials actually do care and want to invest in this space. Probably the sort of Gen X, which are probably my, my sort of seniors and, and also, also parents are probably not so much. Interesting conversation I recently had with a lot of uh, Gen Z um, with a couple of kids in the universities um, on the various programs is that actually one thing that Gen Z can do is actually ask their parents where the money is being allocated because the Gen Z are in their early 20s. The parents probably are not retired yet, uh, but also in the process or, or you know, potentially they are, but or maybe, maybe not in the process of they have pension funds. I say, why can't you just ask your parents to actually allocate capital to 
to what you truly believe is the right place because your parents are retiring handsomely on investment into weapons and controversial and, and oil and gas. If that's what you feel really strongly against, perhaps that, that's a conversation that what Gen Z can have, given that their capital is not that much compared to their parents' side. Now, in terms of exclusionary side, um, yes, I think that's a strategy to, to worth thinking about. But like I said early on, by excluding a sector itself or excluding certain companies doesn't really, doesn't really um, sort of has a such a significant effect unless the indus entire industry moves together. Now, give a couple of examples here as part of Q&A, right? Controversial weapons in Europe and defense company has significantly suffered a lot from, from the cost of capital increase. The regulatory in Europe does not allow investment in controversial weapons, i.e. landmines, nuclear or, or cluster bombs. But increasingly, investors do not also want capital to be allocated to those defense companies and not just their own direct capital, but also the banks they invest in. So for example, as a manager A invests in a bank, they want the bank to do the same thing as well, which then leads to defense companies are actually suffering cost of capital now because they can't, they, they are not willing, you know, they can't even get funding from the banks for, or, or, and they, can't, they have difficulties raising debt. Now that actually has an effect. However, exclusion on the brown sector is a bit different. And because the brown sector companies have actually been selling away their assets for some of them or spinning off to become a private company. That means you have not stopped anything. For example, if you look at um, the, one of the biggest producers of coal in the world, which is Australia, BHP or Rio Tinto, they've been selling out their coal mines. Who did they sell it to? Private equity firms who still continue to pump it up. So if you look at the export from, from Australia in terms of coal, hasn't actually reduced at all. But then now investors can start to say, oh, we can invest in BHP and Rio now because they don't have coal mines. Has, how has it done to the world? Nothing really, because you are still pumping pollution to the world, you still burn coal. So I think that the more pragmatic way is, you know, a lot of people say this, right? It's, it's to be able to invest in the companies and then really have the patient capital to get the company to transition. Of course, within your investment universe, if you've got five companies that's just in the metals and mining sector, one is, doesn't care about the environment, continue to pollute. The other one cares about it, and but it's transitioning, right? You obviously will invest in one and not invest in the other. The other thing worth thinking about is when one excludes companies, one needs to ask a question about where does the capital go to? Do you actually move your capital towards green solutions or not? And this is another anecdote recently is that when I look at the rise of ESG funds around the world, it's actually directly correlated with the rise of pollution which makes you wonder if there's more and more people investing in green, why is pollution, why is CO2 level increasing? So the answer is quite simple because everybody's excluding high polluting companies, they allocate capital to low emissions company, i.e. health tech companies. So if I, look at the, if I look at all the ESG funds in the world and aggregate their top holdings, they all hold the top five tech stocks in the world. So they invest in Apple, Netflix, Amazon, Facebook, uh, uh, Meta now, and, 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 and Alphabet. So they all invest in tech companies. What does it do to fight pollution and, and also fight climate change? Nothing. Oh, they do some, right? But not in that significant sense. So to, to, you know, to exclude companies is very easy because people on the street, if you tell them, oh yeah, I don't, I, look at my investment fund. It's very clean. I don't have oil and gas. I don't have metals and mining. You say, oh, you're great. You're really green. But, but where does the capital go to? Oh, it's actually going to invest in Netflix. What does that do to, to save the planet? Some, some greenwashing managers will say, oh, Netflix is good people because people don't go to the cinema anymore. You don't have to drive. That's good for the planet. But that to me is a lot of greenwashing. So there's a lot in this space. I think, you know, as you guys start to think about this and come to the market in a sort of new mindset, it's good to challenge the conventional thinking and bring your skills in and then, and then try to move capital in the right place. Absolutely. I agree to that. Okay, so um, we have... Um concluded our question and answer session we do have another question oh we do all right okay um mr kamar can answer this question um this particular candidate uh, mentioned that uh, china has recently decided to launch its own regulated digital currency so uh, he or she wants to know um what does this what kind of impact this would have on the future of Bitcoin and other currencies that are not regulated? And how will this impact the growth of the metaverse and virtual properties, investing in virtual properties? Because this is regulated, this is a regulated market. 
I think I can perhaps give a generic sort of response and maybe pass it on to uh, pass by who's more sort of experienced than this. Broadly speaking, I mean, if China, I mean, they've, if they've come up with a regulated sort of currency, it can pass on China being one of the largest sort of economies, it can definitely pass on to uh, the neighboring regions, if, regions, if not globally, uh, especially the Southeast Asia uh, region. And that really covers almost half of the population of, of, of the world. Um, so that can help really a lot. And as Asimbai was mentioning, digital currencies, they can add quite some value if, if they are regulated exactly. I mean, and if their adoption is in the right way, instead of what currently has been happening and based on my sort of observation, people see them as another um, sort of quick way to, to make the buck where they, they buy a certain uh, coin and the next day, I mean, it either they just lose all their money or they make quite tons of money and then they're gone. Um, but if they are actually adopted in, in the proper way where they can digitize all the banking and other financial um, institutions and structures that can actually help quite a lot and add value to the, to the economies. I agree, thank you so much. Okay, so I think, um, should we let Asim, yes, Asim, if you could offer your insight on this as well. Uh, I'm not, again, an expert on this topic. Uh, I'll just add two cents on it. Uh, I think digital currencies are more exciting, uh, especially for countries like us, where a lot of money is outside the formal financial system. They have the potential to bring that money, make part of it, of the formal financial system. And you don't know that it can probably also disrupt in terms of uh, the country's core problems with regards to taxation, with regards to taxing of assets, and again, making the economy more formal. So I'd be more excited as I guess uh, this is going to take uh, some time. I think even in China, it's on a very limited uh, uh, area or scale. They have uh, started experimenting with it because of course there would be concerns with regards to, of course there is always a challenge with regards to hacking and how can that money be actually taken away. So, so I guess uh, this is more uh, an area of uh, evol evolution and would continue to evolve a period of time. But I think really exciting to watch these developments. Again, also with regards to crypto, my personal view is again, uh, that this, these, are, these are innovations in finance and again, ways to re that, that make you rethink about how the world is changing and how the markets are responding to it. Uh, not uh, it depends on how you use this you approach this as a class this is uh, again not necessarily uh, replace your conventional asset this is just uh, adding one array uh, for us uh, there may be knowledge in uh, probably experimenting with it approaching it learning it uh, understanding how it is ev evolving uh, speculating on it may not help you this may bite you this may uh, may not be very helpful for you and again, we have to be, one has to be very careful with regards to how regulators are approaching it. Uh, right now, financial institutions uh, are not allowed by the regulators to, to uh, actively participate in crypto markets. Individuals can, but individuals should also, particularly the students of finance can also uh, watch this space uh, with regards to how uh, the markets are evolving. Thank you. Okay, Sarish, do we have any more questions? No, that's it from my side. All right, I'd like to thank you all for taking the time out on a Saturday. I know it's quite difficult. We have our, all our own commitments and um, we're gonna wrap up our webinar and um, had a pleasant time with all of you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, thank you. Thank, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, all right. All right, thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.